Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Bruce McConnell. I am the president and CEO of the East West Institute, which is based in New York. Um, and it's a pleasure to have all of you here uh, for our workshop today. Um, and we, we are here to discuss uh, the question which I like uh, very much, can we make peace remotely? Or should we say, how can we make peace remotely? Because uh, all of us uh, here, I think are interested in in uh, promoting global peace. And we're in a tight spot right now on the planet in the time of COVID-19. So to address uh, these questions, we have assembled a distinguished panel and we look forward also to having a conversation with you uh, using the chat function. Please use the chat function to uh, tee up some questions for us to, uh, to ask our, our speakers about um, when we finish the formal presentations. So to get right into it, uh, we are um, here to, uh, with two distinguished speakers who will um, give us about 15 minutes each of their views on the questions of how did the COVID-19, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected their efforts uh, from their uh, international organizations to foster peace during this very difficult year? What uh, lessons are they learning and can we learn to help us meet future challenges? I would say this, uh, workshop is the first workshop of uh, what will be a sh series, not sure how long a series, but uh, in which we will also explore the role of Trek 2 organizations, uh, but we thought it useful to start with the uh, people who are in the business of peacemaking. Our first uh, speaker will be uh, Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs of the United Nations, uh, Izumi Nakamitsu had a distinguished career at the UN and elsewhere. Um, also speaks many language, including cyber, which I very much appreciate since it's hard to find uh, officials at high levels who speak, see, <coughs> speak cyber. Um, she will be followed by Ambassador Tula Uriola, who is at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. She is the officer in charge and deputy head of the Secretariat and the director of the Conflict Prevention Center. Um, without further ado, let me introduce uh, our first speaker, Izumi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruce, uh, for that exceedingly kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to the East West Institute for inviting me to this um, important webinar. I am very pleased, pleased to be here. Um, this discussion on the impacts of COVID-19 on conflict resolution and prevention efforts, in particular through disarmament arms control measures, comes at a, a crucial moment. We have just entered, of course, uh, the decade of action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. However, obviously, the outbreak of COVID-19 has pushed us further off track in our joint endeavors towards this end. One thing is certain, COVID-19 is having a debilitating impact on both security and sustainable development, neither of which is possible without the other. This inextricable nexus is well illustrated by the SDGs, including SDG 16, related to establishing a peaceful and secure environment conducive to development. The Agenda 2030 and SDGs recognize that fragile and weak institutions threaten not only the security of states, but also the rights and safety of individuals and communities. So indeed, the effects of COVID-19 are best understood within the framework of human security, placing people at the center. For my remarks today, I would like to start with a reflection on multidimensional impact of COVID-19 through this lens of human security, before turning to the pandemic's impact on the multilateral disarmament regime and the actions the UN and its partners can take to solidify arms control as a tool for conflict resolution and prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 is having a devastating impact on all aspects of sustainable development, as I said. Health systems are overwhelmed. Livelihoods of half of the global workforce are severely impacted. According to recent data by the World Bank, an estimated additional 88 to 115 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty this year 
with the total rising to 150 million by 2021. 495 million jobs were lost in the second quarter of 2020, according to estimates by the International Labour Organization, and a 4.2% decline in GDP per capita is expected. While all have been affected by the pandemic, it is the poorest and the most vulnerable that are disproportionately suffering. The year 2019 showed a record number of 79.5 million people fleeing war, persecution, and conflict. Unfortunately, this disastrous trend has continued this year. States affected by conflicts are already facing a serious scarcity of medical personnel. To address this situation in April 2020, the UN issued its framework for the immediate socio-economic response to COVID-19. This framework, alongside the health and humanitarian responses issued earlier, constitutes the UN system-wide efforts to comprehensively address this pandemic. Furthermore, to enable the uh, provision of humanitarian assistance and make room for diplomacy in conflict-specific situations, Secretary General Guterres issued a global call for immediate cessation of hostilities in March 2020. At the end of June, the global ceasefire call received the support of 170 states and parties to conflict. However, data on active armed conflict illustrates that the call has not really translated into the desired reality on the ground. Between March and May alone, more than 660,000 people were displaced by armed conflict, leaving more people exposed to COVID-19, while also hindering efforts to contain the pandemic. The International Rescue Committee has put the number of people killed in the first three months since the um, uh, first of UN Security Council's resolution 25 32 on the global ceasefire at appro approximately 21,000. Ladies and gentlemen, as we also celebrate the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security this year, the impact of COVID-19 on violence against women needs particular attention. The UN Development Programme has concluded that pre-existing toxic social norms, gender inequalities, and economic and social stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with restricted movements and social isolation measures, have led to an increase in gender-based violence. Available data shows that reports of violence against women in domestic settings have increased in several um, countries since the start of the pandemic, in some by up to 30%. Recognizing the hidden pandemic, the Secretary General acknowledged this disturbing trend by calling for domestic violence ceasefire, stressing that violence is not confined to the battlefield. So against this challenging backdrop, let me turn to the impact of pandemic on the area of disarmament, my primary area of responsibility, and on what the UN and its partners can do to reinvigorate multilateral disarmament processes in support of conflict resolution and sustainable peace. In his agenda for disarmament, launched in 2018, the Secretary General highlights concrete measures the UN is committed to undertake in support of member states across four pillars, disarmament to save humanity, disarmament that saves lives, disarmament for future generations and partnerships for disarmament. Through its 40 actions, the agenda sets out a holistic approach to tackling the risks posed by the continued existence of weapons of mass destruction the humanitarian impacts of conventional arms and their illicit trade, and the imperatives of responsible innovation in the face of potentially dangerous development of new weapon technologies, all towards the common objective of preventing conflict and securing our common future. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Well, we have been good, we have seen good progress across the pillars of agenda since its launch. The dynamics of the COVID-19 crisis have undeniably exacerbated the already significant strain on the global disarmament and arms control regime. Allow me to elaborate briefly. First, COVID-19 impacts on disarmament that saves humanity. COVID-19 has catalyzed tensions that have been building for two decades. So-called great power competition and corrosive uh, re uh, relations between nuclear armed states, notably the increasing, increasingly strained US-China relations have heightened the risks of potential escalation. Combined with this, several factors such as a burgeoning qualitative nuclear arms race, the growing role of nuclear weapons in strategic doctrines, and the return to warring and um, illusional concepts such as limited nuclear war fighting have spurred the risks caused by nuclear weapons to heights not seen since the peak of the Cold War. Alongside climate change, nuclear weapons represent the greatest existential threats to humankind. Yet the nuclear disarmament machinery has been paralyzed and arms control regimes has been crumbling well before the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. The renewal of um, all state commitments to the pursuit of a world free of nuclear weapons and to all com commitments that of, and obligations they have undertaken to achieve it is vital to reinforcing and upholding the global regime. Nuclear armed states have a responsibility to lead, including through the negotiation of potential risk reduction measures. The extension of the new, uh, the new START treaty for five years will prevent the prospect of unconstrained nuclear competition and bolster the chances for future agreements. Yet in some ways, COVID-19 has also provided an opportunity. For example, I remain hopeful that the postponement of the 10th review conference of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, to August next year will allow states to bridge their divisions and lay the ground for successful outcome that will strengthen the treaty and, by extension, the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. The imminent entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear uh, Weapons, TPNW, adds another pillar to this regime. It will be up to both supporters and opponents of the treaty to find a modus vivendi that ensures divisions do not impede progress across the, the broader regime. Second, COVID-19 impacts on disarmament that saves lives. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, armed um, conflict continued to rage the, um, many in many parts of the world, with conventional arms playing a central role in their uh, instigation and prolongation. Global military spending is at all time high. Illicit small arms and light weapons in particular continue to be primary enablers of conflict and arms violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, fueling insecurity, harming civilians, facilitating human rights violations, and also impeding humanitarian access. The increasing urbanization of armed conflict and the use of explosive weapons in towns and cities have particularly devastating impacts on civilians, causing death and injury forced displacement and destruction of livelihoods and infrastructure. When the UN program of action on small arms was adopted in 2001, some 550 million fine firearms were in circulation. In 2018, there was estimated 1 billion fi firearms in circulation worldwide, with 85% of those in civilian hands. 
vast numbers of firearms, especially those that are not properly regulated, increase the potential for deadly violence. The socioeconomic shocks of COVID-19 have the potential to further complicate arms control measures, including at the local level. Higher unemployment rates and civil unrest could be leveraged to, advantage, uh, to the advantage of illicit arms networks. There's a risk that belligerents, other uh, criminal and terrorist groups, may seek to fill vacuums left through overstretched and weakened institutions and overburdened public services. COVID-19 restrictive measures notably reduced mobility among cities, could also produce new alternative trafficking routes. Would the demands for uh, greater human resources to fight the pandemic rapidly increasing, other public service, services could suffer from diminished capacity and focus, including the exercise of firearms controls. As the pandemic continues to rage, Non-governmental organizations, research institutes, and other advocates alongside the UN have called on governments to reduce excessive military expenditure, demanding that finite public resources be directed towards public health emergency. Nevertheless, despite these calls, many states have continued with previously agreed firearms deals or have initiated new ones. Such times of pressing emergency and widespread turmoil represent a crucial opportunity to propose bolder approaches to conflict prevention, including through prioritization of socioeconomic investment over military expenditure. Conventional arms control in particular is crucial and often overlooked tool in the disarmament toolbox that supports the prevention and resolution of arms control and advances opportunities for sustainable peace and development. Systematic integration of arms control in national peace building plans and development responses and the requisite financing underpinning them are key to achieving this. Given the high value of conventional arms control in challenging moments such as this, we need to seize all available opportunities that can lead to progress, leveraging existing legal and normative frameworks such as Program of Action on Small Arms and Light Weapons, the Firearms Proto Protocol under the Convention Against uh, Transnational Organized Crimes, and the Arms Trade Treaty as crucial global instruments for achieving the overarching goal of preventing conflict and building and sustainable, sustaining peace. The upcoming seventh biannual meeting of states in the program of action on small arms and light weapons, which has been rescheduled for uh, July next year, is expected to provide a platform for states to further strengthen small arms control at the national, regional, and global levels. As the United Nations, we must support states in their endeavors, including in setting national targets on small arms and light weapons, as well as through capacity building and promotion of both national and regional level initiatives. Finally, COVID-19 impacts on disarmament for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, while COVID-19 seems not to have slowed the research, development, and production of new weapon technologies, it has considerable implications on cybersecurity. Increased reliance on digital technologies has exacerbated vulnerabilities in ICT products and services. Reports indicate a spike in spear phishing, attacks and suspicious COVID-19 related websites since the start of the pandemic. More advanced cyber operations have targeted hospitals, medical research facilities and other essential services, including the World Health Organization. Emerging weapon technologies will likely either continue to be actively developed and acquired or 
ever gain higher priority as, uh, as uh, inexpensive means to offset conventionally sterile rivals. Pandemic-related disruption of uh, multilateral disarmament and arms control processes may result in arms control efforts falling further behind the curves of uh, current developments. This trend may exacerbate as the work of disarmament-oriented security policymakers is stopped at the international level, while military industrial interests are continuing their operations with minimal disruption. Countering this trend through concerted multilateral efforts and multi-stakeholder approaches takes on increased urgency in these challenging times. I welcome efforts such as the East-West Institute's global uh, cooperation on um, cyber uh, space program, with its global mobilize, um, um, with its global goal to mobilize governments and private sector actors around developments uh, and implementation of norms of behavior in cyberspace and to promote stability and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. In a nutshell, the global arms control regime is under further stress induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Adjusting to a new virtual mode of negotiating is an additional complicating task, though one that could also expose creative ways of engaging. Virtual seminars such as this one continue to enrich the discussion and allow for vibrant um, exchange on the, uh, the pressing issues of our time. It is not yet clear how this mode of working is impacting outcomes, but over the past several months, the international community has continued to witness weakening relations between major powers, historic levels of military spending, ongoing emergence of disruptive technologies and potential new domains of conflict, and the growing threat and intensity of armed um, conflict. The disengagement of certain states from major international arms control commitments is a step in the wrong direction, a direction that is dangerous for all of us and must be reversed. In the long term, the absence of arms control frameworks that are binding could lead to a return to quantitative growth in arsenals and aggravating um, existing arms control dynamics. The potential for miscalculation is increasingly high, especially given that strategic competition is also relevant in new domains and the employment of new technologies. Retreating from international arms control regime means abandoning the idea of, um, uh, a, post, uh, of a world post-COVID that is safe. It moreover means to reject the basis on which sustainable development and achievements made towards it can further develop and flourish. To maintain momentum to achieve the SDGs, we need to, to be flexible and use technology to our advantage. As the pandemic has forced us to physically distance, we need to come together in other ways to promote sustaining peace. The question, if we can force the world peace online is pertinent. As it currently stands, the answer is we have to try. But we all know as yet, nothing in international relations replaces human warmth. As numbers of uh, conflicts are rising across the globe with old ones still raging, we need to uphold our primary responsibility as the United Nations to prevent and resolve conflict peacefully. To this end, the UN is determined to work with partners at all levels, global, regional, national, and local. To quote the Secretary General, our interconnected world, now more than ever, calls for a networked and an inclusive multilateralism, one in which governments, international organizations, civil society, and industry 
work together towards the common good. Together, we can make the more meaningful and sustainable impact. This is the very essence of the recent UN reforms, focusing on sustainable, sustaining peace, in which disarmament and arms control has a central role to play. We must not allow COVID-19 to change our course and plans for the future. The next decade is crucial to international community in many respects. This is a decade of action for sustainable development. It calls for renewed ambition, leadership, and collective efforts. To build back better from the pandemic, these efforts must put people at the center of global responses to achieve more equitable and resilient outcomes for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Izumi, for that uh, sobering uh, description of the interactive effects between uh, violence and COVID. Uh, there, it's a two-way street and not a good one, so uh, much work to do. Um, let me turn now to our second distinguished speaker, Ambassador Uriola. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to join this very timely discussion. And I will take a little bit of a different approach here um, in my intervention. Now, conflict prevention and resolution, uh, peace building and post-conflict institution building are at the core of uh, the OSC's work. And as such, at the heart of also my own work as uh, director of the OSC Conflict Prevention Center. Now, let me begin by recalling that the OSC is the largest regional security arrangement under chapter eight of the UN Charter. And given that the OSC perhaps is not quite as well known globally as, as, as the UN, uh, let me remind um, that uh, what the OSC offers is a platform for dialogue and joint action for 57 participating states, uh, ranging from Vancouver uh, to Vladivostok. Uh, we also have 11 partner countries um, in the Mediterranean and in Asia. And our secretariat, uh, as well as the specialized institutions, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the High Commissioner on National Minorities, and the Representative on Freedom of Media, as well as our 16 field operations, carry out a wide range of activities to promote security and to reduce the risk of conflict. And what sets us apart from other organizations is our um, comprehensive approach to security. Uh, this includes the political, military, the economic and environmental, as well as human dimensions. And these three dimensions, three dimensions are really very interrelated and interdependent. I would even argue that there is no such thing as a sustainable stability without all the three aspects of security. But we also deal more and more with transnational threats uh, like terrorism and organized crime and uh, cross-cutting issues and challenges such as the promotion of gender equality and combating uh, trafficking in human beings. And in the political military sphere, uh, the OSC facilitates uh, confidence and security building measures uh, such as information exchanges and verification activities. And we provide a platform for our participating states for discussions about ways to reduce the risks of uh, military conflict. Now, in terms of uh, conflict prevention, uh, the OEC is active on um, what you might call different levels. Uh, at the strategic level, we promote the principles and commitments that have been adopted by our participating states, um, including uh, through dialogue and partnerships with other organizations. Structural prevention addresses uh, the root causes of conflict and instability, for instance, by supporting the rule of law and good governance, tackling organized crime and corruption, and promoting political inclusion. And our field operations have specific mandates to engage in this work in Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia. And operationally, we work to prevent the escalation of conflicts into violent crisis through early warning and early action, confidence building and preventive diplomacy. And we have a long track record in facilitating political dialogue and engaging in mediation. In fact, currently we serve as mediator in the trilateral contact group, which addresses the crisis in and around Ukraine. We also mediate in the five plus two talks uh, on the Transnistrian settlement process. And we co-chair the Geneva International Discussions on the consequences of the 2008 conflict in Georgia. 
And even following the recent outbreak of conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh and the recent trilateral agreement, the role of the Minsk group and its co-chairs uh, remain crucial with a view to status negotiations in that conflict. And I should also say that the OSC plays an important role in facilitating dialogue between communities at the national and local levels. This is through our field operations. And having personally served as head of the OSC program office in Dushanbe in Tajikistan, I know how important it is to be present locally and to engage at the community level. And Still to understand how the OSC operates, um, I should mention that alongside our comprehensive concept of security, a couple of other features uh, also set the organization apart from others. Um, organizationally, we are a complex set of executive structures under the overall political leadership of the foreign minister of the participating state holding the OSC chair in a given year. Currently, that is Albania and uh, from January onwards, Sweden. The OSC chair has the ability to engage in conflict prevention efforts and exercises its leadership in various ways, not least through its representatives in the various OSC negotiation processes. And in terms of decision making, it's important to note that all OSC decisions require consensus. In other words, all the 57 participating states need to agree on every decision, including in a given conflict or crisis situation and in addition to the parties themselves who are directly involved on, on where and uh, whether to engage. Now to turn to um, how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our efforts to foster peace. The pandemic has indeed had, a, had significant implications for all the three dimensions of security. And I have to say that we're very proud of the fact that at the outburst of the pandemic in the early spring, OSC decision-making bodies were swiftly able to move to online or, or blended formats, allowing our organization to continue to function effectively. All the OSC structures have in fact worked energetically to promote dialogue, to offer recommendations and to build capacity to address um, security-related implications of the pandemic, such as limitations on human rights, new patterns of corruption and increased uh, domestic violence, for example. And programmatic work has been refocused to meet shifting needs and delivery has been adapted to the current circumstances. But it must be acknowledged, however, that in the political military area, uh, threat perceptions have increased because verification activities conducted under the OSC framework have come to a halt and the already scarce opportunities for dialogue have further diminished. The um, OSCE welcomed and supported the UN Secretary General's calls for a global ceasefire in the face of the common threat from COVID-19. But sadly, our hopes that the pandemic could encourage cessation of hostilities in conflict in our area or offer an opportunity for confidence building measures around the response to the crisis have not been fulfilled. I would say that on the positive side, since July, we've seen a sustained and largely respected ceasefire in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, the sides have yet to capitalize on it to make progress on other tracks. Our special uh, monitoring mission to Ukraine, SMM, has continued to provide regular monitoring and reporting uh, including with the help of UAVs and cameras that actually had been introduced uh, well before the pandemic. But uh, challenges to freedom of movement for civilians and the SMM alike have uh, become more acute due to the pandemic and in those conditions. Uh, the work of the trilateral contact group has continued via teleconferencing and the observer mission at uh, two Russian checkpoints on the Ukraine-Russia border has also continued its work without interruption. Unfortunately, we saw war reignite for a month and a half in the Nagorno-Karabakh context. And we now have to renew work toward a peaceful political settlement in changed, but still very delicate circumstances. In other contexts, such as the Geneva international discussions and the Transnistrian settlement process, the pandemic has hampered contacts and operation of the existing formats. It has effectively diverted attention from conflict resolution processes. Each process is different, but some commonalities do exist. 
Um, and social distancing and prevailing restrictions have made in-person mediation difficult if impossible. But the settlement processes as such remain as relevant as ever. Uh, one could say that the pandemic has indeed accelerated the need to find appropriate technological tools to support mediation, dialogue facilitation and capacity building. And we've therefore endeavored to bring as much of our work into the virtual space as possible. All our field operations have also continued to operate, although much of their work has been moved into largely into the virtual mode. And well, relying solely on virtual formats is, is obviously not ideal. If it wasn't evident before, by now we know how essential informal contacts, the discussions in the margins are to building trust and to floating ideas. And, you know, the risks and opportunities of using digital tools also need to be carefully considered. While digitalization has been an extremely important asset during COVID, maintaining contacts and the degree of oper oper operability, uh, there are also drawbacks. As we know, malicious actors have, for example, doubled down on disseminating disinformation to polarize and increase distrust in societies. So, the negative impact of the pandemic on OSC operations and on security and in our region is real. And this impact could be exacerbated further by the economic crisis that will affect all states in our region as well as globally. And there will be, already are, implications to the most vulnerable populations, including in the conflict zones. But we actually also expect to see an impact on, our, uh, on the resources uh, which the participating states make available for our work. And obviously our resources and ability to have impact go hand in hand. But we are proud of our proactive and uh, flexible response so far, including the rapid adoption of technology to enable business continuity. Well, the pandemic is likely to continue for some time. Adapting existing means of conflict resolution and mediation to be uh, COVID-19 sensitive, so to speak, that's essential, both in terms of content and practicalities. And we have an opportunity here to reflect on some of the fundamentals that underlie peace processes. How do we ensure that they remain or become even more effective and relevant once the pandemic is over? In the area of conventional arms control and confidence and security building measures, the crisis demonstrated the potential of new technologies. Even though on-site verification visits have not been possible, all military information exchanges have taken place fully electronically. Uh, in addition, I should say that the OSC structured dialogue, uh, this is an informal working group to discuss uh, challenges in the political military sphere. Uh, so the, the structured dialogue has discussed options for applying technology to verification in times of crisis. Now let me highlight some other ways in which our efforts have already been or could be adapted during the pandemic. We know that we face an unprecedented global challenge, so it would be unwise to assume that nothing has changed. It's worth revisiting our understanding of the objectives of the conflict settlement processes and of the interests of the involved actors, as well as integrating new dynamics into earlier analysis. On the other hand, it is clear that the pandemic has had a significant negative impact on progress towards gender equality. This should push us to strengthen our work for the inclusion of women in dialogue and peace processes. And we can consider integrating relevant issues into the dialogue formats, such as healthcare, environmental issues, or humanitarian aid. To offer an example from the Transnistrian uh, settlement process, the OSC has supported rapprochements between the sides on the provision of medicine and freedom of movement of medical staff. So we have flexibly responded to the immediate pandemic related needs in the context of the conflict settlement process. As an other, other example, in the context of the Geneva international discussions, the OSC has helped to facilitate local agreements on access to water for the local population. So to conclude, um, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented uh, effect on multilateralism and on conflict resolution efforts. Uh, as we know, being the first pandemic in the digital age to affect all countries around the globe at the same time. 
and as its effect, effects rather on security become clearer, um, we need to proactively seize opportunities to increase the effectiveness of ongoing conflict prevention and conflict resolution processes. And in particular, we will be taking a fresh look at how conflict analysis, gender mainstreaming and virtual tools can better support mediation in the context of this pandemic and in the future. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Uriola. Uh, I really appreciate in particular your uh, review of the OSCE's uh, functions, which are often uh, misunderstood and underestimated the importance of kind of that middle ground that you occupy uh, in a, in a uh, tough neighborhood, if, we, if, you, if I may say. Um, and also the interaction between uh, cyber uh, and, um, and virtualization, if you will, of all of our efforts as we are, are doing here today. And as, uh, as Azumi said, uh, nothing replaces human warmth. And that's certainly true when one's having discussions in the margins, which are so difficult to have these days. Well, uh, we're now going to turn to our two discussants uh, who will give brief remarks uh, reflecting uh, on some work we've been doing here at the East West Institute and also on the general uh, discussion that we've had so far. Our first uh, discussant is Navard Chalikan. She is a consultant for the East West Institute and um, in the context of this work has been working on a project uh, to uh, explore the effects of COVID 19 on the work of track two organizations and is also based in Yerevan and will have some comments on the situation uh, there uh, in Armenia. Um, is, she will be followed by Mark Meyerowitz, who is a, uh, a professor of humanities at uh, State University of New York in New York, obviously, and an expert on US and Turkish relationships. He is a senior fellow at the East West Institute and a wide-ranging and humorous uh, observer of today's, uh, of today's world. We're also supported uh, in the back office, if you will, uh, by Dr. Walter Lodwig, a senior fellow in our South Asia program, and uh, by uh, Alex Schulman, who is uh, basically um, manning the door and otherwise handling the technology. All right, uh, let me turn the floor over to you, Navard. Hello, everyone, and um, I want to start by thanking you, the distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Under Secretary General and Ambassador Uyola, for a very interesting and timely uh, presentation of these very intricate issues. Um, I, together, as Dr. Uh, McConnell said, uh, I, together with my colleagues from East West Institute, have been working on a paper titled uh, global changes and track to diplomacy in the times of COVID-19. Um, I will, I would like to very briefly present some very general conclusions because uh, a lot of what we have covered, um, you have already mentioned in your uh, in your presentations. So just to give a brief uh, overview of the paper. Um, in global terms, we know that COVID-19 has brought forth and accelerated many international security issues. Um, first of all, the pandemic has worsened the current conflicts and is fomenting new ones. And Unfortunately, despite the U.S. Secretary General's call for universal ceasefire and, uh, and cessation of all hostilities, uh, the conflicts uh, continue and new conflicts are rising. Um, the, the conflicts, in their turn, accelerate the speed for the, the speed of the virus spreading. And uh, as the populations in the conflict zones, as well as refugees, are especially vulnerable to this disease. Uh, another security issue is the rise in terrorist threat and radicalization. And as we know, many terrorist groups, such as um, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and others, uh, have been exploiting the pandemic and actually taking advantage of the uh, crisis in the world. And so there is also increasing arms race among states, as well as a pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, and the, as the implementation of arms control regimes becomes problematic under current circumstances. Uh, so these um, security threats uh, have generated actually a very 
great demand for international conflict resolution organizations, um, a demand for them to be more um, uh, active in preventing and stopping conflicts. And they have also generated probably greater need for uh, informal dialogue and trying to uh, activities uh, that are being conducted by NGOs like EWI. Uh, so if we speak in economic terms, uh, the demand for conflict resolution is higher, probably higher than the supply at the moment. So we need to think of the ways to increase that supply. Uh, so my uh, general question to, uh, to our distinguished speakers, the first question would be, um, how can the organizations working in track to informal diplomacy fill in the existing gaps and cooperate with international conflict resolution organizations um, to solve some outstanding issues related to conflict prevention and resolution. That would be the first point of discussion. Uh, and But before we go to that, I would like to give a, a brief um, overview of our case study, uh, that is the um, war that has been happening in the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, as Ambassador Uriola mentioned briefly. Um, so uh, to just say it very briefly, uh, the self-proclaimed Nagorno-Karabakh Republic supported by Armenia um, had seceded from Azerbaijan after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1990s. And since then, a fragile ceasefire very successfully mediated by the OSC Minsk Group, and for which uh, a great credit goes uh, to that organization, uh, was maintained for 26 years, up until this very fortunate year of 2020. <laughs> So, in the autumn of this year, contrary to the UN call for universal ceasefire, um, Azerbaijan took the advantage of the global crisis to solve this conflict by military means and attacked uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Azerbaijan was uh, in this endeavor supported militarily by Turkey, which you know is the second largest army of NATO, uh, and it got uh, a tremendous weapons supply from a number of countries like Israel and Pakistan and others. Um, and it attacked uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, that's only 150,000 uh, population, um, the, uh, has, has 150,000 population, and uh, was only supported by a landlocked Armenia that has 3 million uh, population. So why I'm bringing these details is because to illustrate that this was a very highly asymmetrical war, um, in which there have been a lot of um, breaches of international law and obligations um, that have altered the balance of power. And, um, and so the, Azerbaijan was using a lot of um, weapons like uh, air, to, uh, air to surface missiles, strike systems and prohibited cluster bombs or heavy artillery. And all of this was used on the civilian population. Um, and uh, Azerbaijan with the help of Turkey also employed so, mercenaries and terrorists from Syria. Uh, Ward, uh, please finish up here, thank you. Yeah, uh, so my, I, can, I, can I just ask a, a question to follow up with the, with the presentation of this? Sure, go ahead. Uh, so my main question, uh, why I il illustrated the conflict is to ask the qu question of uh, what actually can the UN and other international bodies do to uh, strengthen the mechanisms of preventing such conflicts uh, and uh, for um, actually maintaining uh, the ceasefires that have been in place and uh, holding uh, accountable those who are responsible. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Navar. That's a great question. I appreciate it. All righty. Uh, Mark Meyerowitz. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, for the opportunity to participate in this webinar and my thanks to EWI and to Devard and to Walter Ludwig for all the great work that was done on this. We were a great team. And I want to thank very much uh, Under Secretary uh, General Nakamitsu and Ambassador Uriola for really eye-opening presentations. I learned so much today, but I'd like, if I may, in my very short amount, because I see the time, to really do a little wake up call on the pandemic. 
what did we learn from the pandemic? Well, we learned that yes, the world is in conflict, but why? And the answer is because of the great powers. And I think that Under Secretary General Nakamitsu very well pointed about pointed out great power, competitive competitiveness, and the problem in U.S.-China relations. And I would say the same thing in U.S.-Russian relations. These are the central issues. Number one. Number two. What are we going to do when we figure out how to solve the pandemic? Are we going to go back to business as usual? Or are we going to come up with something new and different? And that respect, the question I will pose, and perhaps a little bit out of the box, is maybe the United Nations system, uh, which was created after World War II, may not be um, amenable to the world as we see it today with all the difficulties that we have. Maybe there needs to be a reset, a relook at the UN and how it functions. Now, I believe that the transition from President Trump to President Biden will be very helpful in this respect. Why is that? Because we're going to have a lot less of this shaming and criticizing of the UN and diminishing the UN's important. You're going to have Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield is going to be a cabinet member. And in the real world, it's the great powers that govern. When I was in my graduate program at Fordham University, my mentor said to me, who was an expert, actually, he actually served as a, as a delegate to the Vatican mission at the UN uh, and wrote reports for them. And he said to me, Mark, at the, U the UN system functions, which will never interfere with great powers. And if you look at the various conflicts we've been talking about today, we see this very clearly. So for example, and without going to the details of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a horrible conflict, the, the fact of the involvement of the big powers, Russia, Turkey, all these powers, particularly Russia and its close involvement, Russia became the one that settled out the whole thing. Now we can debate that till tomorrow. The, the human cost of it is, is absolutely horrific. And I totally I feel terrible about it, but Russia is the key player. If you look at the conflicts between China and India, China is the key player in the South China Sea. I'm not going through American foreign policy here, but with Trump going to Biden, we're going to see a calming down of many of these issues. And I believe better engagement on the multilateral level because as you know, President Trump pulls out of the WHO, he pulls out of the INF. He doesn't want to do multilateral treaties. We need more multilateral engagement. And when you do that, you have the opportunity for track two engagement. But if you have a president who basically rejects the idea of negotiation and compromise, then you don't have a chance to have any solutions to these problems. Now, I thought, um, uh, very interesting comments uh, about uh, the activities of the OSCE, impressive, uh, about the UN, very impressive. I, per I personally, for many years, was a vice president of the United Nations Association of New York. I'm a I love the United Nations, but I, I want to see it be more respected. You know, when the Secretary General calls for a worldwide ceasefire, global ceasefire, and the rest of the world ignores it, that is deeply hurtful to me because they, we should be listening to the secretary general, to the good offices. That was the idea. But maybe we start to have to rethink our structures. Now, the other problem is this. Let's recognize that with the pandemic, states have been looking inward. They're trying to solve this problem. It seems so overwhelming. So, and the world hasn't really worked together, but we're going to try to get over it. When we get over it, we need to formulate some new approaches in order to deal with the very pressing issues that our distinguished speakers presented to us today. The weakening relations with major powers, we've got to get that back up because otherwise there's no structure to work with. And certain anomalies, which I think was what was also, it's an anomaly that Iran is a party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I mean, I, I don't want to become, uh, you know, a spokesman for American foreign policy, but so, look, uh, finish up here, Mark. And in conclusion, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I really uh, enjoyed. I learned an awful, awful lot. But I think we should just sit back a little bit and think a little bit more about these issues. Thank you, Bruce. Mm, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for those uh, remarks. And uh, what we're going to do, we also have received a number of. Uh, good questions in addition to the questions from Navard and, and Mark uh, from the uh, participants. I'm going to read off a couple of them and then we'll give our speakers the last word here. Uh, 
Uh, it looks like we're going to run over for a few minutes, but I, I urge your patience here with us. Um, so a uh, variety of different questions. I think the two principal areas of questions that we received are uh, kind of like, uh, why is it, this is a philosophical question perhaps, why is it that this, the COVID-19, which could have brought us together around uh, as, a, as a species, if you will, as a global population around humanitarian uh, activities, why has it having this effect that, that our speakers, uh, all of our speakers have pointed to, which is things have not gotten better in terms of working together, they've gotten worse uh, and so, so uh, surely there are some some bright spots in there, but but kind of a philosophical question. And then the second question is, uh, will we go back uh, to the old ways of uh, in-person meetings and uh, flying around the world, all that, or are we going to end up uh, in a more of a hybrid uh, and and what uh, ambassadorial would call a blended format? More, what have we learned about the way that we'll do our work? Uh, as international peacemakers. So um, with that, I will turn the floor first over to uh, Ambassador Uriola, and then Izumi, you get the last word. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, indeed, there will be a lot, lot yet to discuss. Can you please make this a two hour uh, <laughs> event next time around? Thank you. Um, just to kind of, let's say, indeed, I think, um, I mean, there is, to what Mr. Merovich was saying, kind of, and to what you were asking in terms of, um, you know, I think that the, the respect for international organization, I mean, there's been talk of a crisis of multilateralism for quite some time, and, and states looking indeed more inward now, um, even during the COVID crisis than, than, than perhaps uh, normally. And I do think we need new um, approaches. Uh, what I always see here and, and say here that is, of course, it is very much up to the, in the OSC for our participating states. I mean, it's, you know, uh, the secretariat is there to support, but, but it is the participating states who are in the lead. So, so, so I think it, with the UN too, uh, with just an even bigger number of um, member states. And so I think we have to rely on the recognition of those uh, states to recognize what is useful in, in, in uh, multilateralism. But um, I would say from our part, sort of uh, to end on a positive note, first of all, that while here in Vienna, for example, we see that there, the discussions um, uh, at the permanent council and so forth can be quite, um, uh, let's say the tone can be quite negative and there can be a lot of disagreement. But um, at the same time, we're doing a lot of good all the time in the field and we have continued to do so even throughout the pandemic, although of course in more restricted circumstances. So going back to normal, no, going, uh, going uh, let's say getting uh, out of this new normal, yes, hopefully. So I'm sure that we will keep a lot of the sort of blended, let's say, uh, formats at work. I would say we just had a ministerial council, our annual uh, meeting uh, last week. And if you think about the fact that, uh, and this responds also to one of the questions that I saw in the chat, we have this consensus mechanism. The 57 participating states need to be uh, agreeing on anything and everything we do before we can go ahead and do it. But you know, it provides actually legitimacy and weight to our decisions, to the decisions of the participating states once there is agreement. Um, but of course, the other side of the coin is then that when there is no agreement, we, are, we, we cannot move forward. But as I said that, um, I'm, I'm personally, I wouldn't be working in this job if I, if, I, if I didn't think that the organization was doing a lot of good. And um, I think that it's understandable that countries have turned inward. That's what happens when one is in, in crisis. But at the same time, organizations such as ours, we are there to help push that uh, look outward and, and to a more global level. Thank you for that, that, uh, that great insight. I think that's, that's right. We have to give, give ourselves the benefit of the doubt in some ways, I suppose. Izumi? Yes, thank you. Um, look, these are really uh, heavy questions, um, and it's it's very difficult to answer those uh, questions in in you know in a very short period of uh, um, a time that is available. But let me say, you know, I think we all agree that COVID nineteen pandemic actually really exposed the the problems and challenges that we had had already, and that really exacerbated. The already divided and, and really uh, um, you know tense relationship between those great powers, um, those uh, you know from our point of view, international security and disarmament, um, those tensions actually pre-existed before COVID, 
and that is exacerbating. Um, and um, you know all the the challenges and and, and the problems we we, we all know. Um, but one thing um, that I would like to also um, emphasize is that if you actually listen to majority of leaders at the UN multilateral settings, admittedly from middle powers or small countries, um, the, you know, majority of UN member states actually are saying that multilateralism is crucial uh, because of um, all these issues that are global challenges. Without global cooperation, we would not be able to uh, resolve them. Um, so let us not forget that um, you know, majority of states still support and, and really stress the importance of uh, multilateralism. Now, um, Mark said that uh, maybe we should reset. Um, I agree we should reset and uh, rethink, but without the major disruptions, you know, let's, um, because both the League of Nations and the United Nations, you know, these uh, two uh, international architectures were created uh, because of a world war. Um, what we need to do in terms of resetting and rethinking uh, has to be smooth transition or I would say transformation of uh, the systems that we have. And that's what the Secretary General says, networked and, and, and um, uh, inclusive multilateralism. Um, the UN is obviously intergovernmental platform. Um, it's not in the, the sort of DNA to work with um, industry, private sector, civil societies, etc. But we want to do that. Um, or actually, I would say we need to do that because the world is really dramatically a very different place. Networked because we know that all these uh, challenges are so um, uh, massive that we cannot be solving this alone at the United Nations. And that's why we need to work with um, regional organizations, sub-regional organizations. They are many. Uh, we just had, uh, I attended, um, uh, a recent uh, Secretary General convened uh, a regional organizations uh, summit. Um, so we need to make sure that those international and multilateral organizations will be working together um, in a, a network and then also in an inclusive manner that uh, includes um, you know, non-traditional uh, actors. Now, why we are in the state of where we are, um, I, 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 I say, and, and Probably this is politically incorrect, um, but it is because of um, a lack of political will and lack of most, most, most of all leadership at the international level. So we need to make sure, uh, and I count on also cooperation and support from um, civil society organizations and think tanks, we need to generate the leadership, particularly from those uh, great powers. Um, we are obviously returning to a, a Cold War-like situations, but in a much more complicated and complex settings with all sorts of other um, regional superpowers in existence uh, with, uh, you know, all sorts of new weapon technologies, etc. What we need to have is a realization, especially from those powers, that being a power also means responsibility and the leadership. Um, and uh, uh, we will continue from the United Nations to remind themselves that there are a whole lot of uh, behind the scene quiet diplomacies uh, taking place at the UN, which we don't talk about because it's just not something that we can talk about. Uh, but we would like um, think tanks and civil society actors to also uh, impress upon those powers um, that they uh, return to leadership and responsibility, uh, because uh, uh, that's what the world needs in, in um, uh, you know, pandemic and also returning to a post um, uh, pandemic, which will have to be a better world. It's not going back to normal, but we need to actually build back, build back better. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Izumi, and uh, in, uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, building back better. Uh, the uh, you know your point particularly on uh, on networked internationalism. I think there have been a number of recent initiatives uh, and actually a long tradition in various parts of the United Nations to involve uh, civil society and uh, and industry and unions. I think, for example, of the International Labor Organization, which involves voting by non uh, non state actors who are participants, etc. So. 
I think it's it, we're seeing it in cyber, as you know, uh, there's quite a bit of conversations which engage with civil society and with industry and some of the cyber norms work that you mentioned uh, that we've both been working on. So some progress in those areas uh, along the lines of the reset that Mark was talking about and institutional change. And uh, as, uh, as someone said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And that's certainly what we have here. So it's really an opportunity, I think, uh, to step above the fray a little bit and think more strategically about what we can learn and how this uh, this global event, uh, which has another you know a year at least uh, for us all to go through, uh, can make us uh, start to think about well what worked well and what what did not work well and um, and of course we all hope uh, that our leaders will uh, will uh, seek their better natures and that they will be encouraged by their populations. Uh, to do that on behalf of all people. Um, we, are, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to mention uh, that uh, we'll leave the room open for another five minutes. I don't know uh, if uh, Ambassador uh, Uriola or uh, Izumi, whether you can stick around, uh, but you're welcome. I know you have uh, other things to do. Um, so you're, uh, thank you for being here. And um, uh, if anyone uh, wishes to make a comment, uh, there, the floor is uh, open. Uh, you can raise your hand uh, by waving uh, or, uh, or that kind of thing. Uh, Mark, I mentioned also that uh, I should mention that the recording of this event will be posted. So uh, we, will, we will look forward to uh, hearing from you more about that. Feel free to write to us at the East West Institute uh, with any comments. Uh, and questions that we'd be, uh, love to continue this conversation. And we will have another one of these I mentioned uh, I hope it can last more than an hour, and uh, we'll be focusing more on the role of Track 2 organizations uh, at that session. All right, thank you all so much for this and for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, have a good holidays, and uh, stay safe and, and healthy. <laughs>